I'm Norm Silverstein. Thanks for joining us. We're in good company today with Sean Dunwoody. You've seen his art around Rochester, and today you get to meet the artist. A self-described creative force for change, Sean has used his talents to create public arts projects focused on uplifting the communities he works with. Sean is a native Rochesterian. He grew up in the Market View Heights neighborhood. He's focused his life's work on visual storytelling, collaboratively painting murals that communicate powerful ideas. You probably saw his street art sharing messages of safety during the pandemic, or his most recent work amplifying the efforts of the Black Lives Matter movement. A catalyst for change, Sean has used his ability to connect with others to serve in a number of advisory roles. While helping to advance the cultural and economic well-being of the Finger Lakes region, Sean is also bringing much-needed attention to areas of critical need in many city neighborhoods. Referred to as a visionary, he's been voted Best Local Artist, Best Muralist, and Best Art Exhibit in 2020 by City News. Sean excels at putting his finger on the pulse of the Rochester community. He's always looking ahead to consider what might be possible, especially if we all work together. We're pleased to welcome Sean Dunwoody here today as he reflects on how his work has brought meaning to his life and the lives of so many others. He will also share how public art is an important medium for telling the stories of our times. Sean, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's great to be here, Norm. Thank you. I, I want to actually take the, what it is that you just, <laughs> just said. That's amazing. I was like, wow, that sounds great. Thank you so very much for, for having me here. Well, you've received a lot of recognition lately uh, for the work you're doing, and I want to know what has this meant to you uh, in this time to get this kind of recognition? Ooh, okay. What, is it, what, is it, what does it mean to get this recognition? Um, I, I, I really want it to be about others. It's really not about me. It's not about what I'm doing, how cool someone may think I am, or how many walls I've, I've put paint onto. I want it to really about the attention of the people and the causes that are behind what's being created. Listen to what's happening behind being created. It's not about my show. It's about those voices that carry on and will carry on. That's really what I want people to recognize, that there is a movement surging. So listen to it. Pay attention. It's not about me. I'm just a smoke, smoke screen right here. Pay attention to what's happening in the communities, what's happening to the hearts of the people. And that's really where I would like to see recognition going. And I try to try to deflect it over there as much as I can. But it, it does feel good, cool sometimes to have the recognition. I can't deny, you know, you got to feed your ego. Uh, but in all in all, I want others to be recognized and understand uh, their role in this world. You know what? <laughs> uh, I've interviewed a lot of people for this show. But mm -hmm. a lot of times people say, well, I was born in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's rare. It really actually is rare that someone says, well, I... I was uh, born here in Rochester mm -hmm. in Market View Heights. So mm -hmm. you've come a long way yeah. for a kid from the city, but you've also had to overcome a lot. Yeah. Are you comfortable sharing a little bit of what you've had to do to, to get to the position you're in today? Yes, I, I grew up um, in Market View Heights on Rich Street, actually, uh, where my parents, uh, prior to that, uh, they owned a record store called The Rat Hole. Um, and uh, everyone would come there and get records and stuff. But this later on in life, so it's 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 still part. It's still in the crescent, Le Crescent, as they call it. You know, one of, now it's one of the, the more porous uh, neighborhoods in the area. At its at its time, years ago, it wasn't. And um, from that, I spent a lot of time in the crescent. You know, and from there to the one four six two one neighborhood. And uh, you know, you grow up uh, single parent, uh, not too much, not too much going on as far as finances in the home. But uh, I always, always wanted to be, I always wanted to be an, an artist or creator or, you know, I always wanted to be a superhero. I got God's honest truth. I always wanted to be a superhero. One of my, my, my favorite superheroes is Spider-Man. So I always wanted to, you know, swing from, you know, spider webs and, and, and do all those things. Um, but uh, I found my connection from drawing and comic books and all those things. One, one story I have to tell, I was five, year, like five years old, and uh, there was this cassette tape. You know, well, folks know cassettes. Uh, so I had this cassette tape, and I would fill it up with uh, dead spiders that you find on the windowsill because I wanted to be Spider-Man. So I figured if I got a, snow, a, a sewing needle out of my mother's kit and I had a, an accord that was cut, and if I stick this into the wall socket and electrify this blood and then poke myself, I'll be Spider-Man, right? Uh, oh, luckily, my mom came and <laughs> was like, what you doing, boy? And so uh, I realized from that point on, I had to f figure out another way to be a superhero. So uh, in life, I was, I, I was always connected to art and drawing. I always wanted to do those things. But when you're sometimes in a community or in a neighborhood where no one's doing that, it's 
hard to it's hard to really talk about it and say this is what I want to do and it doesn't fit the mold of everybody else that's around you and it sounds a bit ridiculous it's like okay so you're going to starve to death so you want to be an artist what does that mean you're not going to make any money you're, 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 you can't do this uh, later on in life you know going to high school I got I got tossed out of two high schools um, at, at the age of you know 18 I'm having my first child by the time I'm 21 I got three kids um, no money, no education, part of a social service system. Yeah, but and you did have three men who believed in you, right? You <laughs> yes, that's right, that's right, that's right, and that's part of the journey. Uh, I have these sort of connection points. I call them my, 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 my three fathers. So, um, you know, in, in the system, I, I expressed I wanted to do what I do today. And one of the first individuals that, that helped me understand the strength of being a black man was actually uh, Mr. Kelvin Farewell. And uh, he made me understand the strength of, of, of my African ancestry and who I am and, and, and be strong as a black man in this America that may not want you to be that strong. Uh, another uh, person was a pastor, Luis Hernandez, who told me, who taught me about a spiritual path, how you can be connected to all, how things can be really be connected to your heart, and we're all connected, and we're all God's creatures, or we're all part of the universe. And uh, another mentor was uh, artist Joe Hendrick, and he showed me that art can actually be a vehicle and a way to express yourself and make connections in this world. You know, what was interesting to me was you, you, you become successful in, in more of the traditional uh, gallery scene, and then you decide that you want to be involved and you want to do public art. So something must have clicked. Yes. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you something clicked. Uh, so, you know, time goes on. I, I discover that the art is cool. You know, I'm doing assemblage, you know, and I'm telling the stories, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is great. I'm the artist sipping wine. I think I'm cool, you know, giving the lectures. And... Um, I was, I was addressing an audience at a university about my work, and I looked at the audience and I said, okay, it was, it was, it was all Caucasian audience, and I said, the messages I'm talking about may be beneficial, but I don't think they're actually going to do anything with it, and it's just nice art. So I said, I, I've missed my path. So I stopped the gallery work, stopped that sort of lecture circuit, and I said, I have to go back. I have to go back to my neighborhood. I said, I need to be what I wanted to see when I was 15. As I said earlier, there was no examples of someone that showed I could actually do that. So that was actually one of my points where I realized I've got to go back and be that African-American male on the block helping to build his own community through art. Well, that must have been tough. I mean, you, you go back to the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and you know, what was there that, that kept you going? It's, it's, it's the heart of the people. I mean, it's a creative, there's a creative culture in the neighborhood. I mean, most people think that, you know, the hood is, is, is hood, but there's a lot of creativity that happens in the midst of, of s some stretched or non-stretched resources or lack thereof. You have to get very creative. And so there's always this great flow of energy from people, uh, from the block to the, to the, to the bench, uh, uh, to the field. Everybody are doing what they got to do. And it's, it's a great way to get the energy and get in, in, in contact and connection with people. And that spirit drives me to keep uh, going in, in, on the streets and doing something. It's also uh, what I heard was that you also reminded people that a lot of what we see as art today comes from black culture and mm -hmm. has been kind of appropriated mm -hmm. by by the uh, European mm -hmm. white yeah, you, go ahead and say it. I know. I know it's a tongue twister sometimes for uh, <laughs> European white males to say. But uh, yes, yes, I see. You, you can see that within the culture. I mean, as I said, when you have an, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to say oppression drives creativity, but when you've put people in a certain situation, it, it gives them a creative. They have to find a creative outlet. So if we look at jazz, America's music, it was it was born of the people of the, the people of African descent. So uh, it was here. It was created. You're trying to create an American music, and with within the the lack of resources created a, a, a movement of music that's all over the world. We can see this again when we look at hip-hop culture, whether, whether it be from fashion, uh, dance, to, to art, graffiti, uh, to the music. Hip-hop culture has traveled the world. When everyone thought it was going to be a fad like disco, there's people that are sagging their pants and rapping it in Dubai and in Japan and in Ireland. So, and, and they're spray painting walls in the UK and in Australia. So this culture, this American culture that keeps traveling around the world that then becomes comes, you know, vanilla iced and, uh, you know, um, Macklemore is actually comes from uh, the brown people of America. You also use words in, in your murals. And that was something that I kind of I didn't realize it until I read about it. But although I've seen your work, I, I never put the two and two together. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're uh, trying to accomplish? Because I know there's a reason for it. OK, yes. Um, a lot of times in public art, there are images 
that are used. And uh, when, I, when I started to venture out to do this, I realized images can change in the neighborhood because there are some murals I've seen where people have you know, blackened out their teeth or whatever or, or marked over them. But I felt um, the English language hasn't changed in, in, in uh, well, it's had some tweaks for the past 400 years. So why don't I use words? And um, I, I took a, a tick from advertisers because when you go to any bodega corner store or billboard in the hood, they're advertising to you uh, hot subs, cold beer, cigarettes, lotto, EBT. No, I'm not knocking anybody who engages in, in any of those things. I do. But so I'm just saying, I realize if, if advertisers have that, that power over us with, with, with the words that they, they say to us, they show us every day, but they've got us for four seconds. So I realized if I can use that same approach, I have an individual for about four seconds to to take in that message. And so that's where I wanted to use words. And my first approach at that was actually painting the front of stores, which are in most cases across from a bus stop. So people are sitting there for 15 minutes. So you can actually infuse something a little stronger than just this is what I'm a, my neighborhood's about is about beer, cigarettes and lottery. Well, you also used uh, words when you painted the uh, Black Lives Matter mural mm -hmm. on uh, Court Street. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the uh, community chalk mural at MLK Park. And I know you also did the piano keys uh, down across from uh, the Eastman Theater. And I know there's a little story behind the, uh, the Black Lives Matter mural. Are you willing to share that with me today? The oh, color yes. of, the, of the words and mm -hmm. where you put it? Okay, I'll go, I'll go through. Yes, I'll tell this story. Um, uh, so uh, once the first Black Lives Matter was painted in, in Washington, I got a call from the city and they're like, hey, can we do this? And I'm like, um, yeah, let's do it. We can, uh, we can, we can do it this weekend. Uh, so it, they called me on it Monday or Tuesday, I can't remember. Uh, and we were going to do it that weekend. So the original plan was to do it on Main Street over the Genesee River. And so I called in to my friends over at Sherwin Williams and I'm like, hey, uh, we're doing this on the street. Can I get some yellow paint? And, uh, you know, I'm going to need about 100 gallons of yellow paint. <laughs> 100 gallons. Yes. And they're like, we don't have enough of that in, uh, in the area at all to give you that. And so they started calling around. Even in, in, as far as Buffalo, uh, there wasn't enough yellow base uh, to make 100 gallons of yellow paint bright yellow paint. And so I was like, okay, well, can I get green? They're like, we need the same base to do that. Uh, and I thought, okay, we, we know that there, we, we know there's this, this blue lives matter and the black lives matter. Black lives is about one's racial identity. I'm always going to be black. I can't retire from being black. I was born being black. Then you have your blue lives matter movement. I understand you have to, you, I have respect for people's lives. I have spec, respect for people, but this is a position you can leave and retire from. You weren't born blue. I was born black. So I had to, I had to play with the idea of the only color I could get enough of was blue. Oh, what am I going to do? And I knew I, was, I, I knew I would catch some flack about it. But, uh, you know, when you rest your mind and you rest your spirit, sometimes things come to you. So it came to me and I realized, you know, ancient Kemet, uh, as some folks may know, is, is Egypt. Ancient Kemet uh, used blue to depict their Nile. And blue was a very valuable, valuable color to use in ancient Kemet. So I said, this connects us to ancient Kemet, to our ancient, our ancient African ancestry. And it also flows, our water, our, our Genesee River flows south to north, just as the Nile does. So I said, this will make a, I can make this connection. And then it was like, we were put on hold and told to stop. We're not doing it. And I was like, oh, they were like, well, I was like, if we weren't, if you didn't want us to do it, I could have had more time to plan and could have painted it yellow. But then we moved it to Court Street, mm -hmm. which I was, I was bothered by. I was like, why are we moving it to Court Street? But then uh, once we got there, I realized that it, it made sense. It was where the, everyone was gathering for the protests. And also it was, it was being directed at some uh, individuals that were in that particular uh, station in, in that building who, who were on uh, the radio who were just fired maybe a day or two before we painted the ground. So it, it, it makes sense. So we got out there and we made it happen. I did catch some uh, uh, slack and, and feedback from people from it being blue. I mean, it, it kind of it hurt. But um, because... It, at that point, I'm like, I am, a, I am a black life, and I was out there until three o'clock in the morning to make sure those lines were straight. And uh, now you want to beat me up because of a color. So just, 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 just chill a minute. Let's work together. Yeah, that got a lot of attention, didn't it? I mean, from outside of the Rochester area, it was. Yes, it did. It did get a lot of attention because people, because the the way the the Black Lives Matters color as they were going was with the yellow, and they're like, this guy's doing blue. So everybody's like, is he secretly trying to support the Blue Lives Matter? Is he uh, making? It was. There were all these different connections, and it was. It, it, am I making? a political statement. I'm, I am cahoots with city officials. There was a whole, whole bunch of drama. 
What about The Empire Strikes Back? I mean, I'm into Star Wars, mm-hmm. too, but how did that come about? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll go back to, to the, uh, that Black Lives Matter that we painted on the street. I said, we can do that, but we have to do more. Mm-hmm. And uh, I proposed to the city that we paint uh, the entire inside of Martin Luther King Jr. Park black. Uh, reason being is because when people are gathered there, there's an energy, and, art, and protests are always based in art. You know, you've got your, your, your creative protest signs, you've got a march, you've got a song, you've got some poetry, you've got a dance that's happening. So all, all your, your protests are based in uh, art. So I felt, you know, when, when people have their signs and they have their chants and they're marching and they're doing everything, there's a certain amount of energy that's there. And when people leave, when it dissipates and it's over and the signs are taken away, w- there has to be a way to retain that energy. And so being that the, the bowl of MLK Park is an amphitheater where they used to have concerts, I felt why not help to amplify those voices in that bowl? And so I took to uh, painting the inside of the bowl black. I put a call out uh, first day. Um, uh, predominantly African-American women came out and helped me paint those walls black. And then we, two days later, we did the ground. And the next morning, I put out some chalk and I said, here it is. Say what you need to say within this amphitheater. With, within a few hours, it was filled. Uh, and one of, the, one of the more beautiful things about it is that uh, what, what else it has become? Okay, after the rains, it's gone. But then it, it, it miraculously comes back again. I have, I have yet to put chalk there s- since the first two days, but there's always chalk there for someone to work with or someone to use. It's now become the people space. People document what people are saying. Uh, I felt it was a good way to connect with those individuals who might not go to the rallies or who might be afraid to go to the rallies or might need a better understanding uh, from, a, from an outsider view to actually read what is said and what's going on down there. Well, this was a tough time to get the community involved. I mean, people, nobody seemed to trust anyone. How did you gain the trust of the folks to come down there and work with you? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, <laughs> a lot of times it's just you put it out there and some people can, can understand the, the vision behind it. So those that, like I said, the first day those, those women came out uh, with their children, grandchildren, they, they understood the vision. They understood the power of amplifying uh, the voice of those who are not represented or heard to give them a, a platform. And I think that's what people, people trusted themselves in it. it. They didn't have to trust me. They trusted that themselves were part of the process and shaping something that people will always have a connection point to. You know, I loved uh, the piano keys and uh, and hated the fact that we didn't have the jazz festival this year. What do you see a future for um, murals like that 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 connect to the local community? Uh, yes, well, yeah, that was a, that was a great endeavor. I have to also thank. Um my partner on that one, Richard uh, Glazer, we were, we were moving forward. We have this concept of painting these piano keys, uh, which was more connected to just the, 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 the music's hub that's happening with, with Eastman. Uh, we feel that we've got, we got some funders on board. We're ready to go and roll. And then there, was, it, uh, there were places and people that were like, no, we don't want you to do this. And it was, literally all we needed was your okay just to close down the street. I mean, it's the city's property. The city was on board with it. Uh, so there was a lot of this and that. So the project was not actually going to happen. Uh, until they understood what it could mean. And so we, we, we got out there one morning. I called out to volunteers. I said, if you want to come join, come on out. So there were about uh, 80 volunteers that showed up that day. I, I told people what to do, and they did it. I didn't actually pick up a brush or anything at all. Uh, so the community actually did it, all of strangers, uh, from literally people that were 8 to 83 showed up to paint that. And um, after it was done, we took our picture. Uh, Two days later, it's in the Washington Post, which gave that attention, which then draws attention to the Jazz Fest. Uh, and then those, those folks and, and institutions that didn't want us to do it were quite happy that it was done and started using that crosswalk and a lot of what they were doing. So uh, sometimes it takes a little bit of, of push and drive to get something accomplished uh, because it, I always think about art in the afterlife, not in the moment, but what does it do when you're not there? When, when I step away from uh, one of these walls or the ground, it has to do something. And it actually became, it became a destiny nation during the jazz festival. People were going there to take pictures on it, dance on it. What, whatever they were doing, it became a second attraction outside of Jazz Fest. So it, it was the, once again, it became, the, it became the people's place. Yeah, I bumped into Richard at the Piano Keys uh, not that long ago, and uh, he told me the whole story and, of course, wanted me to cover it more with WXXI. <laughs> so you just got your time for, uh, go. <laughs> for the Piano Keys. Um, and that was a great, that, mm-hmm. that, that was fascinating. You know, when I first saw that, I was like, we should have, we should have paid more attention. To this. Um, you know, I, I find it interesting that, that with all the, the great work you're doing, you find time to be on a bunch of like economic development committees. And uh, one of them was the uh, 
I guess the group that was overseeing the skate park. Uh, the Rock the Riverway Committee. Yeah, yeah the yeah. Rock the Riverway. Mm -hmm. And that uh, you found that, that some of the people on the uh, committee didn't think that, uh, that, that skating was something that black people did. It was only <laughs> It, was that yeah. was that really true? Yes, that, yes, yes. There was there was we had our, our closed room discussion and and uh, so it was it was not it was never when we went to the communities and spoke to people and we got community input uh, and shout out to Rock City Skate Park they've been at it for 10, 10 plus years actually their first fundraiser I held in my gallery ten plus years ago and um, so they've always been at it and it was not actually part of the, the Rock the Riverway plan and we sat down at at our last decision day. We've already collected information. I said, we've got to add this to this. Uh, some folks felt it wasn't safe. Uh, some folks felt it wasn't that, you know, uh, poor people don't skate or black people don't skate. And I'm like, look, man, what are you talking about? It's one of the more, more connected sports that we could have. I mean, there's people skating in Pittsburgh. There's people skating on Portland. There's people skating on Joseph. It's one of the things that will bring people together. Do you understand that the, that, that the skate culture is, is just a culture? Uh, and so after, you know, back and forth and, and everyone's starting to understand, okay, maybe this is something that self-programming space will be valuable to downtown and will bring different people together. And now uh, in a couple of weeks, they're going to have a ribbon cutting and it's going to be one of the, the first things done part of Rock the Riverway that, you, that will bring people together and bring people from outside of Rochester and outside of the county here to engage in what downtown life is about. Yeah, I've heard from people uh, that uh, this got done because you were in the room where it happened, like they said in Hamilton. Did you feel that way at times? Uh, yes, I have to say that. And, and so every time I see uh, Bob Duffy, he's always like, skate park, uh, because it literally was not in the plan. And I'm not going to say I had to fight, but I had to push to make sure that happened because it, it was not going to happen. And so uh, the first person to really get on board and, and help it was, was Commissioner Norman Jones. And he's like, I see where you're coming from. He's like, all right, let's do it. Let's fund it. And, uh, it, and then everyone around the table felt it was a good decision and move. So uh, part of uh, people ask, you know, is it, you know, you're always on these committees or whatever, but you have to be in the room to make these decisions. You know, you have to be there. You have to try and speak for the voice of not, not for the people, but with the people. And so I try to do these things so that eventually uh, other people fill those spots and can help shape the community and the world in which we live in. I mean, do you see some change now where you're not always the only black person in the room? Yes, yes, I see that. I don't want to be the token all the time. You can't be that all the time. And so it's, it's a good thing that there are uh, stronger uh, audiences, and I mean, stronger people and voices out there, like uh, um, Free People Rochester are great, are great folks. I mean, you've got great voices and great visionaries that are rising up and, and that will lead this community into new directions where I think Rochester uh, doesn't quite understand and may be apprehensive to go, but it's going to be a fantastic ride. Do you have some thoughts about where the city is going? I mean, you're so involved, wow. and th right. these are these are tough times. I mean, <laughs> yes. not just one thing. I've never seen everything come together <laughs> like this, and not in, always in a good way. Mm -hmm. Do you have something that makes you optimistic about the future? Yeah, yeah this is this, this is a, this is a turbulent season here in Rochester, and uh, it's been it's been a turbulent time across the world, across the country. And I think it, it was it was important for that to happen. I think we didn't have the opportunity to see ourselves. We didn't have a, a, a breath moment to look, our, look in the mirror and see actually who we are. And I think this has happened in our country. This happened in the world. This has happened here in Rochester. And I feel as if, I, I'm very optimistic. I mean, as I said earlier, you've got these, these younger voices that are, that are coming through. Uh, we have some of our, our, our elders as well who are listening and working along with uh, these younger voices. And, it, and it's part of Rochester's heart. Um, we, we came here because of the, everyone came here because of the falls, the native folks, the indigenous people, uh, those who wanted to settle here. Uh, it's, it, it, was, it, ha it has life energy. It's always turning, always changing, always new. And so that energy is at the heart of Rochester. It's always changing, always new, always flowing, always going, always flowing. And I'm, I'm optimistic that even though there's a rough uh, rapid that is happening right now, that falls energy, that, that, that momentum will bring us to a new level. We have to actually take a leap. We're going to take a leap, not sudden steps. If we look at, you know, parts in history, uh, there's always this moment in time where it takes a, a, a leap. And we're at that point where we're ready to spring forward. We're being compressed and we're being compressed. But it's only a matter of time before we actually leap. And we will be a brighter uh, and better Rochester. And I'm optimistic because I can see it in the people under these trying times. Well, I uh, was surprised to find out you're doing so much work out of state. Um, I guess that uh, your reputation is now really creating opportunities for you around the country. Uh, that's got to be brand new, and that must feel pretty good. 
Oh yeah, it does feel good. It does feel good. I mean, I've uh, my work has brought me to uh, places like Poland, uh, to Brazil. I was just in Indiana painting. Uh, I was supposed to, I'm supposed to be in Nebraska, uh, but that's not going to happen due to COVID. And I was supposed to be in Ireland and in Minsk and in uh, Lithuania this year, but all those got canceled. But it was actually a way to work with communities, the same thing I do here, to create a message of, of connectivity. So yeah, it does feel, it does feel I, I, well, I don't want to, it feels cool. I'll say sometimes it feels cool, but I'm still this messed up dude that I am. You know, I'm not going to sit here and lie and think I'm cool and all swanky. But it's just, it is sometimes neat when, you know, when you're in another state and then Forbes writes about you being in another state. So you're like, all right, I can ride with that. I'll take Forbes. What do you see uh, for the future of arts and culture in Rochester? I mean, we always talk about how important it is and how, you know, it's not appreciated, but it really is one of the big drivers for our community. And now with the COVID-19, uh, it's like people are staying home. It, we, we can't open theaters. Mm -hmm. it, it, these are you know, very difficult times. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it, it is a difficult time for, for the arts in Rochester around the, across the, the country. Uh, my opinion, I think uh, sometimes we have to look, um, we have to look at different avenues or different ways that arts are being used or appreciated um, and, and, and incorporate them and bring them into, into together with everyone. Uh, one of the things I, I talk about a lot is, you know, you said, you know, theaters aren't open, things aren't happening. Well, now due to COVID, neither are churches, but uh, every Sunday morning, you can always get a free concert uh, of poetry and some sort of dance if you stop into, into, into any neighborhood church. Uh, and, and so there's always arts and cultural happening in creative urban areas uh, where, where people are. And I think uh, we, we have that time, once again, to look in the mirror and say, have we really connected? Have we really invested in these, these arts and cultures that are not represented by pre predominantly Caucasian males? Uh, let's look at everyone else and see what they're doing. What are, what are, what are some women uh, creatives doing? What are, what are artists of color doing? Let's really understand what's going on and bring that together. And once again, it's not about bringing people to the table. It's about giving people resources to build their own table. And you can actually have a cross-table conversation from there. And I think that's what the arts in Rochester really needs to look at now is, is who are those voices that are still, that are still creating or, or reaching people and how are they doing that? And maybe that's a model that, that uh, arts in Rochester or some of these institutions might want to take a gander at. Sean, you do some great work and you bring a lot of good attention to the city too and to the movements here. So thank you. And thank you for joining me today on Norman Company. Hope we can do it again sometime. Thank you, Norman. It was great to be part of your company. Thanks, and thank you for watching. You can also watch this episode and past shows online at WXXI.org. And we'll see you next time on Norm and Company.